Okay, so uh, welcome. We are here with a special guest, T.S. Dismas. And he had a unique near-death experience some time ago, and uh, he published a book in Amazon. It's called From Sudden Death to Paradise, the story of a near-death experience. Welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I appreciate it. Can you tell us about your, uh, your experience, how it all happened? Sure. I understand that you work as a military police officer for yep. several years, and you had some uh, health problems uh, before you had your experience. So can you talk to us about that period? Yeah, I, uh, like you said, I was in the military and uh, I was a military police officer in the US Army. And I was given, uh, well, I wasn't given, I was forced to take experimental vaccine at the time and it caused autoimmune diseases to develop, which took quite a few years later for, for them to really take hold and for the, the effects to, to really start to show on my life. So in 2016, you know, many years after having left the military, I, I had gone into a collapse and the ambulance had to come. I, I was intubated for a couple of days. I, I thought, you know, they all thought I was going to die for sure from this experience. We didn't really know what was happening though. The doctor, you know, with autoimmune disease it's very difficult to diagnose. So the doctors were, were trying to figure out what was happening but they, they could only see that I had some heart issues. They were diagnosing me with myocarditis, which is like a, I don't really get all into the medical things, but it's, it's, it's about just that my heart was attacked by, by this particular chemical that had been, you know, in my body. So my body, it was, was actually, this due, actually, was this uh, due to the experimental uh, vaccine you were given? Yeah, because it, what it did is it triggered my immune system to go into a, a, an immune response, a hyper, hyperactive immune response. So now I've, I've developed a bunch of autoimmune diseases which really is my body attacking itself. So my, wow. my immune system now no longer works properly. You also said you were forced to take this vaccine. But when you're in the How's military, that? when okay. you're in the military, you, you have to follow orders. And so when you're, you know, you're a private and somebody who outranks you says, Hey, take this, this vaccine, you know, move out. You can okay. complain about it, but what they did is, is they would always put our, our records or like our shots when they shot that we would get, they would put a record to it and they would stamp it or they would sign off on it and tell us, you know, this is what was given to you. And at this time and by who was it, who administered it, but this particular one, it was a four or five shot series and it was for the anthrax vaccine. So it was still, you know, still in the experimental phase at that time. And so we ended up getting sick from it. And quite a few members of my unit also got sick and had very serious medical issues. Wow. Okay, yes. so uh, you had uh, serious problems because of this years yeah. later. Yep, yep. It, it started, I started having some, some symptoms because, you know, I was a really healthy guy. They put me on heart medications when I was in the military. And I think it was like 19, 20 years old when, when this started happening. And you know, to put a guy that young who was in incredible health when I got into the military and, you know, put me on heart medication, I, I, I didn't even know what they were putting me on. They just gave me a pill, told me to take it. And, and then I couldn't wake up. So that they ended up having to take me off that medication. And, you know, then it seemed like everything was just more about my circulation. I started having circulatory issues and nervous system issues. But over the years, it just progressively got a little worse. And I, you know, I was in good shape and I was worked out and took good care of my health, my eating and my sleeping. And, but I, uh, I just, I, I started to see a real big decline and a lot of it was with my energy. And, you know, I, I didn't notice the signs leading up to it, but once it happened, it, you know, and looking back and seeing in hindsight, I, I could see how my heart had been been just slowly degrading over the years leading up to this uh, this event. So uh, I understand you had a, a heart transplant. Uh, yes. So this near death experience was before uh, you had your transplant, right? That's correct. Yep. I I had the uh, near death experience two years and two months before I ended up getting the heart transplant, which is 
totally amazing when i'll uh i'll send you a copy of my of my heart a picture of my heart when it was taken out afterwards and you can see the devastation that it, that was done to it it's it's just completely destroyed so it wow. was it was amazing to see how god had kept me alive during that whole time and until i could get to that heart and so i understand that i read in the book that you were uh, gone for 10 minutes yes so you, yep. you were declared death dead and uh for 10 minutes you your heart stopped right right correct what how did you come back after those 10 minutes well as far as i know they were doing cpr and then they were giving me like epinephrine um injections trying to shock me with uh the the aeds so there was there was quite a, a bunch of activity that they were doing during this time. And so, you know, I, I know they were working on me really hard, but the whole time that I was gone, I went to heaven. So as far as, as what I was experiencing, it was wonderful, you know, and I, I was able to, to see God and to see Jesus. And, you know, that, that whole thing, I, I was so terrified before all this was happening, you know, sitting there, not being able to, to, to do anything about your health is, is really a, a vulnerable place to be. And, you know, I'm, I'm in this room and there's these probably 20 people that had come running in, you know, doctors and nurses and, you know, techs who are helping with different things. And, you know, so I, I, I was really terrified when it was happening. Okay. But, but when I came back, there was this, this level of peace that it stuck with me. It wasn't like I just had this experience and then I was kind of just left with just the memory of it. It was also like the love had had been imprinted into my soul. There was a change that had happened in me where the the angers or the resentments that I had once had in life, I no longer cared about those things anymore. I wasn't even upset about, you know, the military and, and you know, being being part of the catalyst of what, what led to this. I, I even forgave that. I thought, you know, there's nothing that I need to be upset about. None of these things at the end of it all really matter. It's that love. And I'm always in control of my love. And if I just work with God and his love, then I can, I can always be on the right path. And that really set me straight to where I, I don't stress out about things anymore. I, I don't look at things and think in such a, a selfish manner that you know, like people, people get mad about getting cut off on the road and it's kind of an inconvenience, you know, you get set right. back a little bit, but we often think that the person did it intentionally or how dare they do it to us. And I I've listened to people tell that. And for now, I haven't, I haven't had that experience anymore because I'm, I'm able to look at people and, and see them in, in the way that God saw me is that he loved me despite all the things that I've done wrong and it makes it easier for me to to show love for other people now. So I I'm I'm blessed by by this whole experience. Okay, yeah, well that's really nice. But I would like some details regarding the exact moment when you died. Yeah. What did you feel? Did you leave your did you were you conscious when you left your body? Can you tell us about that? Yes. That's an excellent question. I'm really glad you asked that. That's I was conscious. I didn't lose my conscious thought the entire the entire time. So I I know when I was leading up to death, you know, you, I felt like my body was dying. I felt like everything was slowing down. It was really difficult for me to talk. Okay. I, I felt like even getting my my words out, it was like garbled. You know, it was really forced to try to even say anything. So I didn't want to talk anymore. I just I wanted to just peacefully go because I knew there was nothing left that I could do. That you knew you were going to die. Oh yeah, absolutely. I knew I knew I was going to die because when I went into the hospital, I had seven hours in the emergency room that I was I was struggling for life, and during that time, I could feel the the because I had been in and out of the hospital several times over the the few months leading up to this, and it was like an in and out of the hospital almost every uh, every week that I was going in. Okay, but I uh, I knew I was this one was different. I I could just feel that it was. This was the time that I was going to die. It, things had been leading up to it. So it kind of seemed logical that it was going to happen, but I knew it felt differently. And so when they got me from the ER bed, they thought they had, had got me to be stable enough to transfer me to the ICU. Okay. So they brought me to the ICU bed. And as soon as they transferred me, I went back into this really 
hard um, heart failure event where my my v, my ventricular tachycardia, so my heart started shooting up in really high rates, and so I they started working on me, and they ended up calling in the the crash team. But when I like when I said when I started getting garbled in my voice, and I really couldn't talk very well but I could still think and I was praying. So I just didn't want to be distracted because the doctors were asking me all kinds of questions like, what's your name? You know, things that they knew. And so I, I knew they were just trying to keep me with them. And I, I just said, I don't want to talk anymore. And that was the last thing I could get out to them. And I just said, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. And I felt this shake and a pop. And the shake, I, I'm assuming I probably had like a seizure or something, you know, who knows what was going on with my body. But what I felt was much different because I could feel that intense pain when I died, but it was so quick. The pain was so quick that it, it, it doesn't even register as far as like even all the other suffering was worse than that. That pain was more intense, but it was so fast and it was immediately, all of it was just immediately replaced with this peace and love. Like all of my broken places were just immediately rushed like a flood of just love entered into my soul. So as soon as I popped out of my body, this love just popped right in, just flew right into my soul. And it was, it was just like that. It, it happened so quick. It was instantaneous. So I'm, I'm in this dark tunnel with just love emanating all through me and around me. And I thought, well, I, I can't believe that this is just it. You know, I didn't think that that this would this could be possible to feel this kind of love and I'm looking at this dark void it was like bigger than outer space and I, I couldn't believe that it, I'm looking into this dark void and I could see how you know the depth of the darkness but I, I couldn't see any material objects why you know, didn't you say it, it was a dark tunnel it was kind of like it, it was like there was a, a, an encompassing space okay but it was it was kind of like it was dark like I was in a like the, there was just shadows around me, you know, and I'm kind of just like in this little, little tunnel or a portal or, or something. Okay. And I'm looking out into the, this dark void. So on the end of it was this huge dark void. It was like space and, wow. and it didn't have planets or stars, but it was that huge vacuum of just empty space. But I realized that I could see behind me and I instantaneously at the same time, I guess, is that I could see that I, the depths of the, the darkness. And that's what made me realize that I could see into the darkness. So there had to be light, which I could then tell that I was seeing in 360. So I, at first, I didn't really realize that I had the abilities. I wasn't looking behind me, but I could see everything. So whatever I focused on, and at this point, I was focusing on the dark void, but whatever I focused on, would take my full my full vision so when I stopped looking at that dark void and because I saw that light I immediately was looking at the light so that I could still see the dark void in my in my periphery but I was now focused on the bright light you just mentioned that you had a 360 vision yeah if you could see in front of you behind you and all around you did you have a body did you did, where was your body or, or, or were, were you simply space? Yeah, that's an excellent question because I felt like I had a containment, but I didn't feel like I had a body and I didn't look. And that's that's something that I really kind of wished I would have looked at my body, but I, I didn't feel like a need to. I, I felt no, no, I didn't feel hot or cold. I didn't feel hungry or thirsty. Everything was content, but I didn't. I didn't feel like I was oozing out into space either. Okay. So I, I, I felt like I had a containment, but I didn't feel like it, it felt very different. But at the same time, I felt like me. I didn't feel like I had. Okay. Had, okay. Yeah. So I, I still felt like the, the same, but, but just, you know, with, with no pain whatsoever, no, no urges or temptations or anything that would be distracting. It was just this pure peace and love. There was no other distractions that that were there, sensory or phys, you know, physiologically or or psychologically. Tell us about the light. So the light was just beautiful, and it was emanating that love. I could feel that the love was coming directly from the light, and so I I said I want to be with the light. And as soon as I had made that that conscious thought in my mind, I was there. 
Oh yeah. But what was what was okay. really cool about it is I didn't feel any like inertia. I didn't feel wind on my face. I didn't feel anything to give me the clue that I had moved just as quickly as I did. But I also had at the exact same time, I had a memory of every step I took. So this happened so quickly, but it had to have also taken place over you know enough time to take all those steps. And this was a long ways away, but it was, it was like that, that time just didn't have the same kind of effect as it does here. Okay. You know? It was, it was almost like they were happening simultaneously, but also independent of each other. So it was really, it's, it's really bizarre to even think about it. I mean, it's so far above us as human beings that, you know, we try to rack our head around that and, but it was so easy there. It was, it was as if I didn't have to have things explained to me. I just had to start doing them. And so that movement, it just happened. It just, I was just there and I'm before this light and I could just feel it was just like a palpable love. It wasn't like, you know, when your mom loves you, you know, your mom loves you and you can feel it, but it's not like that, that feeling on through your whole soul. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a contained kind of feeling. And that's maybe the closest we can get to, to that pure love. But there, it, this was like, there was no restraints to it. There was nothing to hold this love back. It was just coming straight into me. And my soul was just accepting it. And right. I'm looking in both directions, trying to find the end of this light. Cause I could see, like I told you, my, my vision was 360, but I could also see as far as I, I could possibly imagine, but I could also see in all directions. I mean, you can see directions. in all directions. Yeah. All directions. Okay. And so I'm trying to find the end of the light and there was, it was useless. There was, it was totally pointless for me to even try because there was just no end. Of were, this were you in the middle of this light? Yeah. Well, I was standing kind of like when I came out of the tunnel, I was just standing before the light and it was, you know, up and down. So I, where I was, was this was light at. emanating I mean, from? Where it was, was it? itself. It was its own self. There but was, it was a, above your head or all around you. It was all Where, it was all around. And, you know, that, that actually, you know, when you just asked that, I don't know if, if it was going past me, because like I said, it was going into that dark void. So it had to be going past me, I guess, at the same point. But where I was standing, it was, it was as if it was the, the light itself was right here and kind of like a, almost like a wall or, or like okay. a, a big, I don't know how to even describe it, but it was like, it went up and down and to the sides in all directions. So it seemed like it was its own own entity right there, but it was clearly emanating all throughout. So okay. I mean, this, it, it was definitely doing that, but then I'm looking at it and I said, I can't believe this light doesn't hurt my eyes because it was so bright that if you imagine a bright light in, in earth, I mean, the sun was nothing near what this light, the sun would have been swallowed like a candle out in daylight. It would have been nothing compared wow. to this light but it was, it was not hurting my eyes. It felt good. It felt wonderful to be able to look at the light and, and to see it. So it was, it was much different than what I would have expected. And I knew it was God. I, I can't say that it was, you know, God's body. You know, there's, there's so much confusion with that. All I know is that this was emanating from God or it was God, but it had the life force of God. There was, it was the source of all love that light was. And so the light said to me, you can come in if you want. And so of course, I was like, yeah, I want to go in. So I, I came in. And then when I was in the light this time, the light wasn't if I couldn't see past it, it was just like I was walking in like a cloud of light. It was just all around me. Every part of my body was just covered with light. And it was going into my soul and flowing back out into heaven all around. So it was like, it was like drinking through a straw to where, you know, you have the, the liquid on one end and the liquid in the middle of the straw and it's coming into your mouth, but it's never, you know, it's never empty in the straw, but it's still going all around in both other ends of it. And that's how I felt like his love was going into my soul, but it wasn't like it just stayed there. It kept going out because it was endless. There was an endless supply of his love. So I was just constantly getting filled with his love, never empty, but it was like, going back and connecting to everything else so everything wow. in heaven was connected together it was it was so beautiful that that it just it's it's almost it almost will bring you into tears when you when you think about it and 
I just said, I want to see Jesus. And as soon as I said that, the, the light opened up and I was in this huge room. It was bigger than that dark void was. And, and it was full of these beautiful, sparkling, just full of light, almost like the light was just popping out of them, beings that were just gorgeous. But there was one being that was right in the middle. You, it was no mistake who this was. It was Jesus. And, but it, he was so bright. He was as bright as the light that was emanating all around us. And it was as if that, that light was kind of the encompassing part of this whole room that we were in. Okay. But I could see, and what I've got to describe my vision because it was like, like right now I can see you. Yes. And I, if I was in heaven, I could see behind you at the same time as seeing in front of you. And then I could do that with every other being that was there right. as well. Okay. So there was not one part of heaven that I couldn't see. So if I focused on it, I would see everything. Now, I was only focusing on Jesus. So everything else fell into the periphery. But as soon as I said I wanted to see his face, that's when Jesus's face started to come together. And as soon as his face came like to where I could see it, instead of just seeing the bright lights, that's when all the other beings also, I could see that they were human beings. I could see that like they, were, they materialized or something. Yes, they like materialized. That. Like I, I, I was being, because before I could tell who they were, I could see everything. It was, it was like, there was no confusion to it, but for some reason I wanted to see Jesus's face. So, so you, you basically said two things. First, you said, I want to see Jesus. And then you yes. said, I would like to see his face. Yes. Your, yes. Okay. Yep. So th those were basically your two desires or. Yeah, those were two questions. really strong desires because everything I was doing was just focused on Jesus. Like even when I was looking at him, I, I said, naturally, I want to see his face. It just popped into my head. So and, did you see his face? Yes, I saw his face. And what I'm going to have to explain this because this is uh, so bizarre to me, but I could see what his face looked like as I was looking at him. But my memory couldn't remember what I was seeing. So could even not? as I, no, it couldn't. I still can't remember what, what his face looks like. So people ask me, well, does he look like this picture or that picture? I'm like, they, they all kind of look like Jesus to me, but I, I, right. I don't know. I don't know which, which one. So I didn't get to keep that, that picture that. Yeah. That the memory of his face. Yeah, it was like, it was like, even when I was seeing him, have you ever seen those little drawing books where people draw a sketch, and then they flip the pages and real fast? Right, and, right. Yeah, yeah. That's what it looked like. Like, I was seeing his face, and it just kept, I kept forgetting as soon as it was coming in. So I had nothing to bounce that image I was seeing off of in my memory. So it was really bizarre as I was looking at him to even be able to, to but see you him. you do remember seeing him. Yep, I remember, and I remember he was smiling at me, and this is why it was so important because I was reviewing all with all with him. I was reviewing all of my sins because everything that I, every memory I had in life, was there right before me. So everything that I did, good, bad, didn't do, you know, all that kind of stuff, everything that, that had ever happened was right there, and I could access it all without any kind of confusion. It was, it was more as if you focused on one thing that would take the priority and everything else would kind of be there, but still fully there. So I'm and this happened, through. this happened when you, when you saw Jesus or yep. uh, all the time. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it was all there the whole time, but I started actually reviewing the, the, the things that were in it. And it was more as if they were just coming out because when I was looking at him, it wasn't as if he was condemning me or anything like that. He was looking with love and just kindness on me the whole time. So he was reviewing your life with you. With, with me. And, but it was me. I was looking at him and I was like, I did this and I did that. It was, there were things that I was upset about and about and you. He was, yeah. And it was, and it was, it was sometimes they were, they were things that were, you know, what I would have thought were in, insignificant, but it was, really hurtful to somebody else that I didn't stick up for him wow. or I, I did something mean and it was that's what the kind of stuff that really stuck because I could see what it had done to Jesus and how it hurt him too because he loves those people that I that I was callous about and wow. careless with my love for and so what he did though was amazing because like I said he was smiling at me the whole time it was as if he was taking all of my shame and all of my hurt all the things that that I was saying, okay, well, I'm going to do this to this person because they did that to me. 
and now I'm holding on to it because it's a resentment. And now I'm not thinking clear, all that kind of stuff in human life. He took it all away. And I was just, I was left with just peace. He was showing me that, that all the things that I had done, how they were wrong, but how he is peace and he is love and he forgave me and he fixed things. He's like a great healer. He healed yeah, all wow. of my broken places. So let's go back to Jesus. Did he, did he, Tell you something. There's a, like when we were reviewing my 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 life, there were a lot of points that he gave me, and they were very personal. So so those ones I don't share, but that's because it was related just to me specifically. But things like uh, you should have done this, or you should do this, yeah. or, or yep. yeah, yeah. And I and those things are what helped to to make that healing stand. You know, to make and me you really, can remember that. Yes, I, I a lot of it. There's some of it that I don't remember. So I I know that there was a lot of things that I I like particular sins some of them I, I i the things that were on the periphery i don't remember as well but the ones that i focused on specifically so like the ones that jesus really talked to me about worked with me on those were the ones that i remember so the the other okay, ones that were, were there a lot of the ones like there were some big ones that we didn't review but i had already talked about that with him i was eternally sorry for those things i mean i had never done them again but yet, you know, there were still things that had happened in my life, but we didn't go over those. So I, those ones, I don't remember. I do remember them from my own personal life, but not okay. while I was in heaven. So, but I do remember I had a, um, an incident when I was six, my great grandmother had died. And so I saw my family members were really upset about that. And, you know, I just as a six year old, I didn't want everybody to be sad over my death. So I asked for a long life and I had prayed for a really long time for it. And that memory had surfaced while I was there. And I asked oh. Jesus, I said, well, what about this? You know, I, I, I asked for this and I, I felt like he had answered that prayer when I was six. It felt okay. like that, you know, like that, like peace had just entered, you know, entered into me and I just didn't need to pray anymore. And I just went to bed as, as a little six year old. So he said that he had remembered it and he did answer that prayer and it still stands. So he gave me the option of whether I wanted to stay in heaven or if I wanted to come back. And I was okay. Why well, uh, come back for what? Did he tell you? Yep. We, and and I, okay. We, so that's what he, I ended up thinking for a second. Like I was trying to think about all the reasons why I would want to go back. And it was hard because everything was perfect in heaven. I, it's hard to even think about anything else as being necessary to do back on earth. That's how wonderful heaven is. You know, everything is going to fall into perfect order there. I don't have to even worry about it. But still, I, I still had this idea that my family would need me and my, you know, my wife and my kids. And, and so Jesus had asked me, he goes, but why would you want to go back? And so that was you know, right there. And I, and that's when I said, well, for my family and for my, for my, my kids. And he said that he loved them more than I ever did. And I could see it. It, it was so obvious. It wasn't like he was doing it to, to, you know, say that I didn't love my family enough. It was just that it was a fact. It was so obvious that he loves all of us so much that we, we can't worry about everybody else. We need to be, you know, worried about our relationship with God, not, not how we're going to try to force somebody else to get to that relationship. God is going to, is going to work, but it was, it was just this perfect trust that I, I could see that I, all I had to do was trust in him. It, there was no, nothing else that I could do. So I, I started to really think then, well, what is it that I could go back for? And instantly I knew it was because I thought I could do more for him. That love that I felt from him, it like inspired me to want to do more for him which the only thing I could do is to show love to other people because there's nothing else I can give to God other than to, to love other people that he loves and to be his hands and his feet and his heart and his arms here on earth for other people. And when I, when I realized that, that's when he said, yes, that's, that's what you can go back for. And then he told me three things. He told me that I need to pray more. And what he was saying is that I need to live a life of prayer, not not always, you know, just on my knees praying for 24 hours a day, but whatever I do should be a prayer, whether it's at work, or if I see somebody who's hungry, and I give them food, all of my actions should be about love and peace. And so then he, he showed me how I need to suffer joyfully. 
And when I was in heaven, that was super easy to understand because I'm looking at God who came down and took, took form of, of a human being because he loves us. And it's all about that love. And really, that's what suffering is, is to love. You know, if you love somebody, your mother, she loves you. She would sacrifice so many things for you. And that is what love is about. Is It's an action. And it's about putting another putting another first. And then I, I realized, or he told me that I needed to share his love. And that was really what my whole purpose was for even coming back was because I knew I could do more for him. And that's what he told me I could do is to share his love. And so that's what he, he said, those three things for me to do. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned two things, pray, pray more and share yep. the love, which is, and, the, which is the third? The suffering joyfully. Uh, suffering joyfully, yep. which means, which, which is with him coming down, I, I saw how it was in heaven, you know, it was to be able to, to put that love of another before our own self indulgences or pleasures before our own needs it to be able to suffer is to be able to love somebody, despite what we have to endure for that love. And, and that's, that's really, you know, it's, it's, it's almost as like, I'll, I'll give you an example with my condition, you know, I had to come back and I have, I've, I had to suffer pretty intensely up until I got my heart transplant. And even after that, it's, it's not been, you know, a, a wonderful, wonderful, pleasureful ride, but I look at it so much differently now because I'm able to, to, to do this and still love God and still share his love with other people, despite the, the pain that I feel where back at, before all of this, I would have been very, very critical of things. I would have been irritable. I would have been more concerned about my own comfort versus stepping out of my comfort and helping another. And so I'm, I'm seeing how suffering joyfully is really still doing the things that we should do with love, despite what we have going on in our lives. Because in life, we, we do have suffering, you know, we, we have a lot of things that we grow old. I mean, that's, that can be a suffering to a lot of people in and of itself. But what we have to do is we still have to share that love, despite what we are going through in ourselves. So before this, before you had this experience, were you a loving person? Were you, did you believe in God? Were you interested in religion? Can you tell us uh, what was the before and after pictures? Yeah, you know, I think I think people who knew me would say I was loving, but I I think that if I'm being honest about it, I was loving in a way that still benefited me. Okay. If, if it was for people that I cared about, it was easy to love them. You know, people that I didn't care about, it was easy for me to turn my back on them and and not show them love or kindness even, I could just show them indifference. And I thought, well, at least that's not being mean to them, but that's sometimes even just as just as bad, if not worse at times. So I, I, I can see that, that I wasn't, I was loving by the world standards, but not really loving when you really get down to it and you scrape off what's being done on the outside. It was, you know, a lot of times I would do what was right because I knew, I believed that was right not necessarily because I'm doing it strictly out of love. Okay. So, you know, that's, that was a harsh thing for me to have to realize because I did always think that I was this good loving person, you know, but to really look at myself and to say, I really fell short. I really was not doing even close to what I could be doing. And it was always because of, you know, wanting something more for myself. The sins that you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned that you, yeah. When you reviewed your life, you took a look at your uh, main sins. Yeah. Okay. It's, when I hear the word sin, I uh, relate. I I think about religion. You know, uh, sure. Catholic religion, basically. So, why do you uh, describe these things uh, as sins? Well, I'll 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 tell you one of the things that that maybe was you know one of my ones that I think was probably the worst, or not the worst of all the things I've done, but one of the worst that that really bothered me is okay. that, you know, I, I had gone for a period of time when you, know, you, you sometimes you'll see people that are, are begging for money on the side of the road. Right. And then you assume, you know, 
that they're going to go and, and waste the money on on some other things that they shouldn't be spending the money on. So you, you choose not to give it to them. Right. And I remember when I was young, I was over in France, I got taken advantage of, I gave a man money and I, I gave him quite a bit of money because I felt bad for him. He really looked very, very destitute. But I saw the same man about two hours later, not too far from that same, that same, that same place. And he was really dressed, dressed up nice. It was clearly the same man. And I felt so stupid because I was a soldier and I, wow. you know, I was on, I gave a lot of my money that I, you know, really didn't make a lot of money. So it was, it was hard. And so I got kind of callous and I, I stopped giving money to, to homeless people for quite a long time. And really what it, what it became about was me trying to decide what they're going to do with what I was going to give to them. Okay. And, it, and that is, is not ever something that I should try to do. I should never try to control another person. If it, it's, it's as if God was showing me in heaven, how he gave us free will. And, you know, I can't try to force somebody else to go against their free will, unless I can help them to understand how it's beneficial. So it, it was about the, the trying to put my will upon somebody else's, not, not to help in God's will, because God's will is for us to have free will. So it was always about me exerting myself above God's natural order. And God's natural order is love. And if all of us would just follow along with that, this, everything would be peaceful. But of course, you know, we have free will. So us as human beings, we choose to do things that that are not in, in line with love. And that's where it always deviates then and kind of goes down that path. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, I would like to talk about your book. and okay. uh, How long did it take you to, to write it? When did you start it? Uh, uh, and give us some details about uh, what made you write it. The book is called From Sudden Death to Paradise the story of a near-death experience. And uh, if anyone's interested in the book, I will include the links in this in the description. So can, can you tell us about the book? Why did you write it? And when uh, was it, how long did it take you to write it? Okay. <clears throat> well, I knew I wanted to write it right away after my I died because I, I thought I wasn't gonna live. So I wanted to try to get it out but I was too sick. I, I just couldn't do it until I got the heart transplant. So that, that two years, you know, I, I, I wanted to try to get it out, but I just, like I said, I was too sick to do it. So it was something that was there in my mind to want to do it. But once I got the heart transplant, it was three months after my heart transplant that I finally got it all written out. And then I started working with a publisher. And then I think it was about four months after I had started working with the publisher that we ended up getting it published but did but, you did it did it take you three months to write it actually yep, yep. That, that's more had, or less fast yeah it was really fast um i i did take my journal so it, a lot of what i wrote was from from my journal that so I. so you had, kept the journal uh, all, all the time yep and so that and and that was that was really helpful because yeah. you know I, I wanted to be able to leave something that that this experience you know wouldn't just die if I died. I didn't want it to just go okay, away. So, right. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I put that effort in and when I, you know, and like you said, it is fast in three months to be able to, to put that out there. That's, that's, yeah. I mean, I really put, put that effort into it because, you know, they, they said, you know, it looked like everything went well in the surgery, but you never know with a heart transplant, it, you know, people do die. So it's something that I, I really put that effort into, but I felt like, you know, God gave me this, this new lease on life, at least I could do is make sure I told that story. So when did you publish the book? When did it actually go out? 2019. I think it went out um, November 1st or October 1st. Okay. You said you had a publisher or was this self-published? It's, it's kind of a mixture. It's with a publisher, but it's self-published. Okay. I ended up I ended up keeping the, the rights to it because a lot of the publishers, they wanted me to take Jesus out of it and just say I saw a spiritual being, oh, but okay. it, was, it was definitely Jesus. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't change that. I, that would have been right. you know, just disingenuous and I, I certainly wasn't going to do it from what I saw. Okay. So uh, you, you are in no way promoting any religion. I mean, 
you, you're just talking about Jesus? Yeah, as far as the experience, yeah. I have my own personal religion that I okay. follow, but but as far as my experience, you know, Jesus didn't tell me that I have to be my, my religion, although, you know, he, he clearly, I mean, that's it falls into it. So, I mean, it was, you know. Well, yeah, well, I always, in my books, I always uh, talk about uh, one, a single religion that it's basically the same message, no matter what religion. You know, you know what's interesting. I it, what you know as you were saying that it, something that I really felt strongly about when I was in heaven is that all prayer goes to God. You know, He is going to hear every. He's everywhere. He is. He sees everything. He hears everything. He knows everything. So in essence, what you said, you know, it all prayer does go to God. So if people have a genuine heart. If they really are trying to talk to God, and even if they're, you know, believing in something that at the end of the day wasn't right, you know, like I believe my faith, of course, but, but, you know, I still believe that people who love God, I, I honestly felt like he loves all of us. I know that. I know he loves every single human being exactly the same. So it's not like he, he loves somebody else more because of their faith or whatever. He loves it because of the faith that they have with him. You're know, right. not a religion, but I do know that that religions help us to be able to to form our relationship with God, and that is a beautiful thing because having that that prayer is important. That's the most important thing to have that that relationship with God, but to be able to practice it so we actually are true to our relationship with God. You know, because I I know I for a long time in my life I used to say. Well, I could just, I don't have to go to church. I can just stay home and pray. But I didn't pray a lot. You know, I, I, didn't, okay. I said I would do it, but I didn't really do it. The honest thing is, is that I just didn't want to take that extra, you know, time and go, go off to church because I wanted to sleep in or wanted to do, you know, whatever else it was that I wanted to do. And, and so it's, it's just a slippery slope that we can get into as human beings where we say, you know, we're going to do this one thing as opposed to, to not doing another. And, like you said, as long as we we really have an, a genuine desire to seek out God, we're going to find him. He's going to lead us to the right path. Right. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, we're nearing the end. So um, what, could, what would you tell someone who is afraid of dying or uh, uh, someone close to him, a loved one, just died? Or is about to die what would you tell them about death well you know i, I don't know how, how much if, if they were really interested in knowing the truth about death it's wonderful i mean that's i i'm certainly not afraid to die again but you know when somebody's in that in that place that's not necessarily what they want to hear but the fact is god loves them so much and and that's the, I think the biggest question is people have is, does God really love me? Am, am I, am I, am I lovable by God? And he really does love us. He loves it. We, we, we get into this habit of thinking that, you know, God is measuring out his love for us because we don't feel like, like we're getting enough of it, but that's not really what it is. It's we measure out how much we accept of his love because his love is endlessly given to us. All we have to do is accept it endlessly. And it's our limitations. It's distractions of the world. So when we're dying, a lot of times those distractions, a lot of them go away. We're not worried about the cars. We're not worried about the house or the jobs. You know, we're worried about the last few seconds. You know, can I make my peace with God? And do I get to say goodbye to my loved ones? Those are the things that are really important to us. And for people to, to really take that time to do make that peace with their loved ones, you know, and, and to know that when they go in into the next life, God is going to make everything better. He's going to heal all the broken places that they've ever had. Everything about this, this life leads us to a better place in our next life, even our struggles. So as we lay dying, I, I hope that my next death that I get to, to enjoy a more peaceful one, because mine was really traumatic, you know, being in the ER and all that. But if, if people who are are kind of coming up to that end of, of life, if they just are able to, to make that peace with their family, that's going to be the biggest thing to help them. Okay, oh, let's wait. Sorry about that. Let's of course, wait. I just got a 
happened to get another one right then. But yeah, I, I, I honestly hope that people just, even people who aren't coming up to the ends of their life right now that they know about, I hope everybody thinks about it, that we could all go in a flash of a, a moment. You know, mine, I didn't see my death coming, you know, either at first, but it, it sneaks up on you and you could go at any moment. Just knowing that, you know, if you find yourself in that dark tunnel and you're looking at that dark void, go to the light. That's the thing I, I if you, I, I felt to me like God is so much of love that he's going to accept even at that last moment to go to the light. I, that's just how it felt to me. Life goes on. There is no death. Death is only a transition. Yes, that's, it's like puberty. It, it's, it's a transition from one form of life to another. Okay. Absolutely. I like that. It's a, great, it's a great way to put it. Well, okay. It's been nice uh, talking to you. Um, Very nice uh, talking to you. I highly recommend your book. Um, where can people where can people find your book? Um, Amazon's probably the easiest place. It, it's at other bookstores as well. Um, you know, okay. then my uh, publisher also has it, so you can look it up and get it get it directly from from my publisher or or you know, there's yeah, there's but Amazon book. is the quickest way, and uh, yeah, it's the basically. quickest way. I I think people have found that's the easiest. Okay, so. Uh, if, if someone is interested, I will include the links, uh, the Amazon links in the description if anyone is interested. And also, I would like to invite a, a, anyone who wants to share his their thoughts and uh, please leave a comment so we can uh, answer uh, if you have any questions. And also, uh, I would like you to... Uh, like this video if you like it i hope you do and subscribe to this channel okay thanks a lot yeah thank you have a good rest of your day